anger. Haiti felt catastrophe shaking in the number seven. The death toll is 233,000 and counting today. Chile felt the same. Learning to find fear in 8.8. Two million people have been displaced. I'm sitting at my computer watching the number rise. It feels too much like Haiti, Katrina, Indonesia. It's been 50 years since Chile has been shaken like this one in the 1960s. 6,000 dead bodies fell through the cracks. 60 sunk in Hawaii. They call this global warming. The climate is correcting itself. I call it earth rattling, quaking, plate shifting, tsunami lifting. The sea is rising. And in my tiny Honolulu town, that means underwater homes. There is a wall of water taunting my homeland. I'm 2,000 miles away. The phone lines are hollow like open graves in Hawaii. Brown bodies are born asthmatic, choking from first inhale, running from an aquatic mountain. Is there anyone out there? It is no wonder we cannot breathe. This is reality. Global warming will break the foundation of a community without even shaking the penthouse suites while the men and women who finance the Earth's deterioration play the role of its savior, sipping martinis in hybrid glass bottom boats, tallying the brown bodies that float by. This society's roots are sinking in quicksand, our hands above our heads, trying to form prayers for relief funds, hoping the government might soon start funneling money back into education so the next generation, if there is one, will learn how to prevent this from ever happening again is as if the government thinks if we are uneducated, we cannot be ashamed of them. Won't understand that the elite only have faith in the privately educated, that the rest of us don't even stand a chance. Cut the crap, it is 2010. Chile has just been hit by an 8.8 .8 magnitude earthquake, sending a tsunami to Hawaii. But you see, we were lucky, because the tsunami barely hit Hawaii shores, but our children were already sinking anyway, because the government's idea of a solution to an economic depression is furlough Fridays. Instead of cutting from a $1 trillion war, we've taken school days from our offspring, and we all know the environment is dying because our legislation is failing at teaching our children to sprout through concrete enough. With a quick fix, band-aids and budget cuts, it is time to fill classrooms, not empty them. Unloading our brown bodies overseas to fight terrorism will not lighten this island enough to keep it afloat. It is 2013. It is time for a solution. Time to stop counting backwards to Haiti, Chile, Indonesia. Do not let the rhetoric fool you. There is nothing natural about the way we have destroyed our planet. Haiti is just 9-11 from a different angle. We are all our own worst enemies, terrorists dressed as patriots. Look around you. The death toll is rising with the sea level. We are all still counting sinking bodies. It is time to decide. Who is going to be privileged enough to survive next time? Aloha mai kako. First, I want to say um, what an honor it is to be on this stage and to follow so many beautiful kanaka, especially the wahine who came up today and shared the mana'o. Um, for those of you who know my work, when I started writing, I was incredibly angry. Um, and if you don't believe that, just talk to my mother, she'll tell you. Um, I hated the English language. I hated America. I didn't know there was a word for the disease that was eating the people around me, but I hated that too. I got on stage and I yelled poetry. And it was good for me. It was necessary. But then a few years later, my first year at Stanford, I took a class called Indigenous Identities and Diaspora Through Performance. My professor, Shereen Raga, who is fantastic, look her up, she's amazing. Um, she's a fiercely queer activist scholar. She helped me develop a vocabulary for understanding art as activism and art as resistance. Later that summer, I traveled to Bogota, Colombia, and said, yes, I am a poet activist. I am a part of a genealogy of women and men of color who write as a method of resisting. I got on stage and yelled. The non-English speaking audience applauded my fierce activism. I felt radical. 
And you know what? I wasn't completely unradical, but the diversity around me while in California forced me to start thinking about race, to think outside of Hawaii. I immersed myself in critical race theory. I ate every bit of it that I could, and then I started to see how many other things I could be angry about. And so I started writing about race. I wrote a poem about my mother growing up in Detroit, 12 Mile. Royal Oak, Michigan in the 1960s where young children, privileged enough to be born on a certain side of the line, played Red Rover in picket fences, just a pebble's throw from Eight Mile Road. America's most def defining city suburb line where institutionalized racism learned to procreate in the time where an integrated neighborhood was deemed unstable. Redlining was used as a district Redlining was used as an institutional product to determine where people of color could live and buy homes. City officials drew the maps and watched the city sink into soil. And in these streets, the red lines still run deep, like the feet of diasporatic people flee. And in 2012, we seem to be burning from the inside out. Realtors using our skin as charcoal, the blacker, the faster they burn, the happier the customer, who are not afraid to say, we want no color here. But it ain't just Detroit. It's Philadelphia, the five boroughs, how our communities turned ghettos began to burn. Best believe it's the dirty South, Los Angeles. It's not like we didn't already know that racism had plagued every inch of American soil. At Stanford, I learned these facts at a distance. In our suburban cul-de-sac bubble, we pretended the diversity in our classrooms means that we came far from our past and that far is enough. We threw the word post-race around as if racism is something we have beaten when we know we aren't even in remission. Those of us born on a certain side of the line remember the taste of race enough to identify what it is and what it isn't. It is the language, how it doesn't fit right on our tongues. It's the history books, accents, it's the process we go through to teach ourselves that this isn't right, never learning how to fix it. No, that would be too dangerous. It only darken the lines between us as if sitting in this filth doesn't. We play discussions with history as if we didn't even learn the lessons and we have read of the lynching how dark men hung in the deep south, white men fronting whiter capes playing God, making angels of young boys. We watched as their halos fell below the jawline, only gasping at the cracking noise of bone to skin to rope. How something other than weight hung in the air those days. It is heat, it is hate, and it is screaming our names. So what happens when in Arizona, black, queer, Chicano, and any literature other than white is banished from the classroom to the furnace? How fast are we burning now when you add the books, when all you can read are white pages? When will there be enough room for our black and brown bodies in this institution? Can you see the smoke rising, the ink hanging? Can you breathe through the hypocrisy or slice it? Can you taste it? How in the last two years, unemployment rose from 6 million to 17, while wealth held by millionaires in the United States rose by 18%. It is 2013. Some red lines have only thickened since the 60s. The government is playing maintenance, and we are burning in the aftermath. Our homes are ground zero. No one comes to visit. No one sees anything but dirt. But just beyond 8 Mile Road, there is a town where young children Privileged enough to be born on a certain side of the line, play Red Rover and picket fences. We can see them from where we hang. Mahalo. Um, so I'm clearly still very angry. Um, sometimes even angrier than I was when I started writing, but I have a vocabulary now for discussing colonization, for discussing oppression, racism, um, homophobia. And I think that's the important part of educating oneself and learning how to tell stories. Um, I found a way to talk about these things, this kind of trauma that doesn't require yelling, which I haven't shown you yet because all I've done is yell at you um, for the last 10 minutes. Um, but there's something important in that lesson to learn how to make your words worth more than the sum of their parts. And that's important in language. Uh, and don't get me wrong, I, think, I don't think that anger is unproductive. I'm certainly not the first Hawaiian to be angry. In fact, just this month, uh, my favorite Hawaiian activist, Jonathan K. Kamakavivo Ole Osorio, my father, um, shared a moment of rage with me uh, during our breakfast routine um, while he was writing an essay in response to the trial of the queen, which just started last night. Um, he said, I'm going to kick their asses. I'm going to kick their asses till the day that I die. That's my life mission. And that it is. Our life mission is to assert ourselves in mo'olalo in ways that refuse to be silenced, that need to be told and retold and re-envisioned. 
this is something that I hope to do today. And I started to think about how I might revision my own mo'olalo and our mo'olalo in a way that is accessible. So I started to think about love. Love as a radical form of resistance, as a process of activism. And I thought about Hi'iaka and Hopoi and the way their love transformed these two women and the aina around them. And so I started to imagine what kind of poems I would write if I were writing about love. I told myself, remember when your hands were dirty, carried the stray pieces of hearts you weren't mature enough to care for, how everything you touched dehydrated, turned to stone, how your uneasiness crushed every statue girl you ever loved, how you were the bearer of dust, of rubble, of broken hearts and empty sleeves. Do not forget the scars, how their emptiness entered your palms and shards, stay there, left its mark. How every time you touch a glass girl now, you crack her with the diamonds crusted in your love lines because this is the way you will learn to love her stable, steady, her only. Think of her anything but a bypass, a highway, a sunrise, or a sunset, anything that makes you feel fast, short, and beautiful. Do not call her an ocean. You gave that name to someone else you love differently. Call her beautiful. Even if it's been said, it is a name she can understand. When she learns to trust you with the shards of her mother tongue in private, tell her you love her. Even if you have known for months, until she is willing to say it in a language that your blood can understand, stay silent. Then stop translating everything and give her the original transcripts. Give her a name for every morning you wake up thinking of her smile, ho'ohoku kolani. For the way she seems to put stars in every one of your skies, haumea. For the way she makes you wish you were more of a woman, pele. For the way she can burn every inch of you with her gaze in silence, papa for how it seems to have given life to everything around you, la'ie kavai, for how you travel all the islands to find her, because you have heard of her beauty and trust it. Take every mo'olalo you've ever heard and find a place for it on the breath between your bodies. Learn its purpose through her kiss, because you know this kind of memory is embodied, and when you are sure, when you are steady, call her hi'iaka, hold her in your chest, Make sure she is the one you will keep, who will stay. When you run out of names, of women, of trees, of roots, call her something heavier. Call her Moana for the bluest parts of you. When you reintroduce her to your father, use the pronoun ku'u because it fits. Because ko'u is too serious and ka'u doesn't quite do it. Tell him that she is every moon you have carved on your skin. And you are every tide that follows. Tell him that she is the morning you have been waiting to name that most nights you are kept awake by just the thought of your lips on her temple, that somehow you find every single one of your gods in the melody of her breath. Tell him that she is real and that you are ready, that she is Hiaka and you are Hopoi writing poems for every part of her body about how you would burn under the weight of her mistakes while planting songs in the form of yellow lehua trees, hoping that the salt water between you might grow something worthy of your love. So being in love and writing about love eventually led me to Hi'iaka and Hopoi. Um, Hi'iaka Ikapoli o Pele is the youngest sister of the goddess Pele and the primary protagonist in the Mo'olelo Hi'iaka Ikapoli o Pele. Pele. Whoa. Um, look up the story if you don't know what it is. Buy the Avaya Ulu Press version, read it. Read any version you can get your hands on. Um, I heard many versions of the story growing up because I went to a Kayapuni school and we just throw stories around. Um, but I didn't really connect with the story until I decided to start researching and writing an undergraduate thesis at Stanford about Hi'iaka and this often overlooked relationship with Hopoi. And then it dawned on me that my childhood would have been significantly different if I had read this story in the way that I was learning it today if I had felt that I was a reflection of Mo'olalo and it a reflection of me without any exceptions that my body, able to love bodies that reflect mine, has been shown throughout our history. I think that's the next step in activism and in writing. Um, I have started to engage in a project where I write, I'm writing a series of poems from Hi'iaka to Hopoi, proposed as a translation of the Hi'iaka Ikapoli Opele epic. And this is where poetry gets into translation. When we decide, like, Snowbird was talking about telling the story from a new perspective, from a new voice. What happens when we give life to a voice in a story 
that has been silenced. So I want to offer you guys these poems as, as a gesture of aloha for you all. Um, in resistance to this silence so that we might find a way to speak for ourselves and see ourselves in our mo'olalo. So these are just three poems. Hemele no hopoi, what they cannot see. I saw you dancing in the distance, pulling my glance with the diction of your stance, moving over land like water over itself, rolling the flowered mist, with a name that speaks too much of your magic, na na huki, too heavy for the diphthong of my tongue. Instead, let me call you hopoi. I have seen you gathering parts of yourself in the form of yellow lehua there. I have been with you since the beginning, only waiting for the pahu to sound for our dance to begin. You created in this stranger in me a lover. Let me cover your body with the sacred skin of this forest. Let me plant you a fortress of rumbling lehua trees, each blossom a promise to return, my love, to move within your rhythm again. But can you see those strange men watching us from beyond the page, see the way they have drawn us naked and grown, how they miss your skin feathered with yellow lehua, how they are writing us into stillness, into silence, how it seems through them we have been forgotten. I wonder how it is they cannot see. I wonder what has made them so blind. Pai kaleo ke kai. I arrived to find the couple men dead, sending songs into the aina before me, scripture composed to the rhythm of your pahu. They land on the ears of friendly host. They claim I am the deity of their dance, the akua they marvel to for this movement, and yet they are ignorant to you. They forget you. Do not see the shadows your palms left pressed against my hips. Do not feel the cool brush of wind to the sweat collected between our skin. They know nothing of the way you fed me your body, how I drank of you until every step was an instinct to praise you. Every ka hea, a song strung from the shift your kino pressed into papa, how you became a kumu only by allowing your body to be lao lehua planted in earth so that you may dance every time the mo'ani ani lehua wind blows. They are stranger to you and our song. And I wonder how they might call themselves dancers and not know your name not have felt the pressure of your poho to their hips, not the whisper of your voice saying pela against their chests. They know not of how this all became the dance I would compose to the rhythm of your breath, only that I have been singing the same songs ever since. They call me their akua, their kumu. All I can do is wonder as a haumana to your ha'a, as a student of this bend at the knee praise, if I have spent enough time in your arms, in the center of your swaying scripture, if I had made a home permanent enough in your body to bring justice to this ummy, to this curve and hinge of the hips, I send my voice to, to you over the ocean, praying for reply. Pai kaleo ke kai, the voice of the sea sings. Ha'a kawahine, the female bends. Ami ke kai o na na huki. She turns the sea of na na huki. Only the silence replies, reminding me I have much still to learn of your body. I'm gonna share with you guys one last poem and then I'm just gonna run off stage really awkwardly because that's what I do. But I wanna mahalo everyone who is here today and um, especially the people who put together this event for inviting me. So give a round of applause for everyone who's been here today. Hopoi kapahaku. I fight to remember the lush of you the makani your skin caressed from this forest, your kuahibi hips calling this papa to ami, made a fool by our love, body turned cavity of fire. How is it that softness never stays? The lush always fades. Now you are stone, ah pa'aikala, silk retired to flame. Man will wall his heo with your body, marvel at the strength of you. You taunt him. He will wish himself a lover in your image, strong, unable to leave. I will tell him that all body's beauty is in dance, in the taunt of come and go. All love's magic is in the choice to stay. Pele and I shall die, a cool body to ash and dust, your newly sharpened skin, the only proof memory provides. You know, we think ourselves invincible as gods, but when the last kanaka forgets our name, we dissolve. Hopoi, kapohaku, the only 
to remain. Mahalo. Ooh.